Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for coming, and thanks for the introduction. Um, yeah, so my name's Memo, and I'm going to talk mainly about the, um, this new work that's been commissioned by Stripe that I'm showing in here. There's a lot of overlap with what both Stefan said, but also a lot of the talks um, that's come up uh, up till now. So first, oh, is there sound? Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, cool. I think there it is. So I want to give a bit of kind of context as to where I come from um, to kind of explain where I am now and where I'm going to. So I, I'm a computational artist. I develop systems, um, usually interactive systems, which I design as kind of instruments which one can use to creatively express themselves. So I've been doing this for a couple of decades now, and my work's evolved from using technology to becoming quite interested in the technology itself and how it's an extension of our body and how it impacts us as individuals and as a society and on ethics and ritual and the relationships with even things like religion and tradition. Uh, and so a lot of these things, it's basically software. That's kind of what I do. I write software. And a lot of these things that I've done in the past has always been very rule-based systems where I program the system what I want it to do. And then I put a person in there, which might be me. It might be a dancer. It might be the public. And then I observe how that system kind of develops. And I've been really interested in machine learning for the past couple of years, um, which is now kind of exploding. There's been quite a few people talking about it. Because that's a very different way of working. It's not so much a rule-based system. It's more a data-driven system, where you don't necessarily have very direct control over the output. Um, so I'm going to talk less about that, but I just want to now jump to, I'm going to talk about two projects. So the first one I want to talk about was um, I did in 2015. It was a performance. I'll skip this video, actually. It was a performance with 16 drummers. And it's, a, it's in a lineage of work that I've been doing for quite a few years, exploring um, the interaction of multiple rhythms and the complex patterns that emerge from it. So this is very much inspired by Steve Reich, Terry Riley, um, aesthetically Norman McLaren, uh, John Cage, that kind of stuff. But also, conceptually, it's very much motivated by the relationship between, say, science and technology with tradition and ethics and culture, in that they're always out of sync. One's always pulling on one, and the other one's pulling it the other way. And, and this goes, you know, this goes back thousands of years. This is this is nothing new, you know, the the heliocentric model of the of the solar system, um, Darwinian evolution. These were all things that upset society at the time, and IVF, uh, synthetic biology, human um, genetic cloning, and now with. AI and deep learning, autonomous cars, etc. So this is a piece that is constantly drifting in and out of sync. It's constantly drifting between chaos and some kind of order. And I really like those moments where it's actually quite uncomfortable. It, it does sound like absolute chaos, but then somehow magically, because it's tuned to that degree, it kind of drifts back into some kind of order and pattern again. And this is just never-ending. It's just continuously looping like this. And this can also be summed up quite nicely. Uh, McLuhan's been mentioned quite a few times. Um, a quote by John Culkin, actually, who McLuhan popularized, which is, we shape our tools, and thereafter our tools shape us. Which is not only what happens to us as a society, but also I feel it with the work that I do. Because whenever I do these kind of things, I always sit down with a particular idea of what I want to do. But the technology I'm working with end up actually dictating what the end product is. And in this particular case, each of these performers, they have in-ear monitors, which is a central computer which is controlling them, telling them when to move forward, when to hit. They have different click tracks and when to step back. So in a way, each of these agents 
they don't have a big picture. They, they can't see what the whole composition is. Uh, there's a machine that's controlling them. Um, but overall, and each agent is doing something incredibly simple. They're just hitting at a steady beat. But the interaction of all of these agents creates this complicated system that is producing these patterns, which is what we perceive. And that was kind of the really interesting aspect of this. But also going back to these tensions between kind of society and technology or, or ethics and tradition. Like we talk about displacements of jobs, we talk about autonomous cars. It was mentioned earlier that the death, um, the unfortunate death of the Tesla accident. In that particular case, for example, even though the you know Tesla had said, do not take your hand off the steering wheel, the person was actually watching a film um, when the accident happened. So it's just incredibly unfortunate, but we need to kind of understand that what we're dealing with are just basically machines. And I love this quote, my favorite quote of all time, pretty much regarding this constant, regarding this um, field. Charles Babbage, the, the father of computers, arguably, who you know built the differential engine and the analytical machine, the first general-purpose computer, arguably, and he says. So people have asked him. On two occasions, I have been asked by members of parliament, pray, Mr. Babbage, if you put into the machine wrong figures, will the right answers come out? I am not able rightly to apprehend the kind of confusion of ideas that could provoke such a question. And this is what we're doing today. We're constantly just unaware of what we're dealing with. Um, and this kind of links on to a poem I wrote, um, I don't have time to read the whole poem, it's a collaboration with Google. Uh, not people working at Google, but the actual search engine, Google. Um, and because Google is basically like the new overseer. I've, I've got a whole thing about this I can't go into now, but I, we confide in it, we pray to it. When we have things that we can't tell our closest friends, we reach out and touch faith. We touch the keyboard and we ask Google. So Google collects our prayers. So this is a collection of prayers. It's our keeper of our collective consciousness. It's basically um, me typing stuff into the search engine, waiting for it to autocomplete, and then seeing what it autocompleted it to, and then just riffing off that. And it's basically um, set to uh, Marilyn Manson's cover of Depeche Mode's Personal Jesus. But from this, I want to transition into the piece that I did here. Um, this is from some research by um, Olivia Carter, where they found that Buddhist monks are actually able to meditate and control the rivalry uh, in, their, in their brand, which I'm going to come to. So the work that I showed here, there's a few motivations behind it. Um, Stefan's spoken about a lot of them. What we perceive to be real, what we see, is a reconstruction in our minds. It's a simplified model of the world, limited by our biology and physiology. Perception, including vision, is an active process. It requires movement and integration. The actions that we take affect the reality and the meaning that we construct in our mind. And perhaps most importantly, even when presented with the same information, the same images everybody will experience will see something unique and personal, which nobody else can see or maybe even understand. And I'm interested in these ideas at a low level regarding our senses and perception, but also conceptually at a higher level um, regarding how we make meaning out of things and what we consider to be truth, our own biases and prejudices, and the results of how this impacts our relationships and society and politics, etc. So, it's the piece is up to the, it's right next to Thought Collider's work, actually. And it, I use virtual reality and binary rivalry and various interaction models. So, I want to go into a little bit about the, some of these things just very, very quickly. So, the Australian jewel beetle, I don't know if you know this story. It basically identifies females based on three characteristics. She's got to be brown, covered in dimples, and big. And this has worked for the Beatles for, for millions of years until we came along and started checking beer bottles in the wilderness that 
also is brown, covered in dimples, and pretty big. And so this beetle almost went extinct because of this, because they prefer to mate with the beer bottles than the females. The, I guess the story here is that this beetle has an incredibly simple and pretty dumb perceptual model of the world, but it's worked for millions of years until we came along. Uh, another example I really like is, is this, is, is lots of studies done on toads, which basically, the properties of a moving stimulus which makes this toad decide to attack something or not is incredibly simple as well. And in fact, this processing happens in the toad's eyes, whether or not something is worm-like or not worm-like. And the moral of this story is, if you subscribe to the notion that God created man in his image, then these examples are void. But if you like me, you subscribe to the notion that we are products of an evolutionary random walk guided by natural selection, then we are merely just further down this path, arbitrarily down this path. And there's no reason to believe that our senses in any way capture reality. Even though our cognitive abilities are far superior to the toad and the beetle, our models are limited in the same kind of way. Um, Stefan spoke a lot about vision, so I can skip to this, which is fortunate because I'm low on time. But often the human eye is likened to a camera, the fact like as if we take photos and that's processed, but, but that's not how it happens. Um, it used to be thought that even in you know, Plato, you could, many people thought that we actually emitted rays from the eyes and those rays coalesced and that's how we, that's how we saw, because they were wrong. Um, but light comes into the eye. But one the thing that this extra mission theory, as it was called, captures really nicely is the fact that seeing is an active process. Like, you really get that. And we forget that because, like Stefan said, the bit that's actually high resolution is like the size of a thumbnail. It's tiny. All of this is just a blur and pretty much black and white. Yet, to me, all of this seems incredibly um, real. And the reason is because my pupils are constantly doing this. They're just constantly scanning the space, and they're integrating the information from my muscles, the movements, with um, the visual information. And with this, what looks like a torture device, Alfred Yarbus in the 50s and 60s did lots of studies on this and gave people tasks and found that the questions he asked people affected how they scanned the scene. And this is why I was fortunate enough to experience um, door into the dark, absolutely beautiful. I don't, I don't want to rub it in, actually. But um, one thing I found so fascinating was, apart from the narrative that was embedded into the experience, I was constantly thinking of a quote by Alvin Noe, a philosopher who talks about seeing is not like a camera. It's more like we should liken it to how a blind person sees, because we don't just take cameras. The eyes are constantly feeling out, and that's what I was doing in that space when I had to let go of the rope. My hands were all over the place, kind of circading, looking for salient features. And when I found those features, I would trace those surfaces and building a mental model in my mind. And that's, you know, sight is an active process. And while we do that, we are constructing this model of reality in our mind. So, fight is a virtual reality work that explores all of this. Um, I don't know how accurate it is to show these images because this is, these are kind of scenes from what you see, um, but the, vi the visual experience is incredibly different because the left eye would see one, right eye would see the other. You kind of see blobs from one, blobs from the other. But one really fascinating thing that I, well, lots of fascinating things that I find is, I have no idea what you see when you experience this. Some people report sharp cuts. They see the image on the left, jumps image on the right. Other people see lines. I see kind of circular things moving around. This is literally the picture in, in your mind. It is different for everybody, even though it's the same images. The other really fascinating thing I find is virtual reality creates this illusion of, of depth because it's got the parallax, all that kind of stuff. Um, so th this scene, for example, it feels like this physical external object in front of you. But as soon as a bit of a disparity starts coming in and a bit of rivalry starts coming in, which is it's about to come in, that 3D physicality of it disappears and it looks like an image in your, in your head. 
instead of feeling like I have a window that I'm looking out into a world, it feels like it's in here, which is how seeing always is. But we forget that, and we think that actually there's an objective reality that, that we're seeing. Um, I think I'm out of time. I was just going to talk about some more of these which but it's all you can experience it. It's um, not sold out. Uh, and I think that's it. Thank you.